Hi, it's Tom from Running Physio here. I've been looking forward to talking to you today about tendons and particularly talking about how you can optimize your rehab of tendinopathy by how you adjust key parameters in load, in range, and also speed of the exercises that you use. So that's what we're gonna talk about in today's video. And in the second half, we're gonna talk about how we might uh, alter load, range, and speed with our rehab progression. So hopefully showing you those principles in action. Uh, if you'd like to find out more about tendinopathy, don't forget we've got a great selection of free webinars available for you at clinicaledge.co forward slash running. Great free webinar series on Achilles tendinopathy, on lateral hip pain, which focuses a lot on gluteal tendinopathy, but also on back pain in runners and athletes. So do check those out uh, in the link that's in the description. So let's start to talk about some of these key parameters. First up, we're going to talk about load. Now, I think we want to say from the outset, we're talking again mainly about lower limb tendinopathy. Um, and it's really important that we recognize there's going to be a lot of individual differences out there from patients that are presenting to us perhaps with gluteal tendinopathy that are quite disabled uh, and struggling even to walk to patients that want to get back to high level sport. So really important to recognize that this is not a recipe. It's about our reasoning process um, and helping you understand how we can adjust these things to meet those different needs. So with load, to get it right for the individual, we need to think about where they're aiming for. For that high level athlete, they're gonna be exposing their bodies to high cumulative loads, high peak loads, they're gonna be training regularly. So they need to take their rehab up to that high level. Uh, we think, for example, the Achilles tendon during running takes typically six to eight times body weight with each foot strike. So we need to train them and help them prepare them for that type of load. If we compare that to someone else who's just looking to try and get back into walking, say, someone with more irritable, severe lateral hip pain, the loads we need to expose them to is likely to be less. If we push the load too soon, it's likely to irritate things. It's also true that if they're quite deconditioning, quite deconditioned, they're more likely to adapt even to lower loads. So we've got to adapt it to the individual to get it at the level that suits them and suits their goal. You know, sometimes it's actually worth thinking about the end point of rehab right at the start because it guides that progression. Now, the first thing we want to do when we're getting uh, load is try and find a manageable level for an individual. And that sometimes will be less than what we might consider to be optimal. So I'd often spe spend that first session or two working with the person, communicating with them, trying different exercises out to see which ones are manageable to them in terms of symptoms. Now, that doesn't need to be completely pain-free. We want to make sure, though, that the pain is manageable and then it settles relatively quickly so it's back to normal within about 24 hours. So we spend those first couple of sessions finding out what's going to work for them. Now, my preference normally is to go closer to the kind of heavy, slow loading route for our patients because I find it to be more effective and I find it's easier for them to do. So I would often see if I can start people at somewhere around about 15 repetition maximum. So at a load where they can just about manage 15 reps, but at that point they're getting fatigue within the target muscle. Now, sometimes this uh, is going to be too irritable for patients. So we can't go straight to that level of loading. So instead I might say, well, let's look to see uh, what level of load you can manage to do somewhere around 12 to 15 reps with symptoms which you consider to be manageable. And then we'll look to gradually and incrementally increase the load as we go. So perhaps we're not quite starting at 15 rep uh, max, but we can ask them to add a, a kilogram or two to the load. Bit by bit, we can get them to increase the load closer to that kind of range that we want. And it helps as well to have simple messages with this. So I'll often say to a patient, I want you to add a couple of kilograms a week something like that gives them some kind of guidance that they can easily go off and follow. Now let's say we've managed to get that patient at close to that say 15 rep max kind of range then we're going to progress in line really with the research in this so typically starting at 15 rep max and building up to maybe 8 rep max or 6 rep max over a period of about 12 weeks. But again there's going to be a great deal of individual variation some athletes won't need to go that heavy, other athletes will really need to challenge themselves and push on a little bit more. 
What it looks like from a practical viewpoint is that each session I have with a patient with tendon pain, the majority of the session is spent trying to make sure the exercises are at the right level in terms of their load especially. So if it's too provocative, can we adjust the load a little bit or change the exercise to make it easier? If it's not challenging enough, if they're easily doing three sets of 15, can we add a bit more load? Can we make it a bit tougher? So the majority of my time with patients with tendinopathy is actually spent loading and experimenting. And then every couple of weeks or so, we'll look to progress. So we might go from 15 rep max to 12 rep max, then on to 10 rep max, eight rep max, etc. So some key points there to recap in terms of load. Find a manageable starting point, that's important. Then look to progress that load gradually over time towards their goals and monitor their response to it as you make that progression. Second up, we've got range. Now, range of movement is really important as well, and it's particularly important in insertional tendinopathies because we know from working with patients and also from the evidence that if you have an insertional tendinopathy and you load into certain positions, which we think lead to more compression of the tendon, it often really irritates the tendon. This is especially true of things like insertional Achilles tendinopathy if you load into dorsiflexion or hamstring tendinopathy if you load into lots of hip flexion. It's generally those positions where the muscle and tendon is under stretch that it will struggle to tolerate. So similar to our progress with load, we first need to find a manageable range and then we look to gradually increase it. Now with most patients, I must admit, typically first, I will try and introduce some load in positions where there is, it's manageable, so not really going into those compressive positions. Because if we can introduce some load and progress their load a little bit, often what we find is those ten tendon symptoms become less irritable. And then that allows us to gradually increase the range. What I would say though, is don't change too many things at once. If you want to progress either range, load or speed, just pick one. I typically get people to change one thing per week, something like that. So we're not changing too many things at once because we know sudden changes in load are often what really upset tendons. So, Typical pathway perhaps is someone with Achilles tendinopathy, if it's insertional, I might start by loading them doing calf raises from the flat rather than on a step, maybe some seated calf raises uh, to, tr to try and work with the knee slightly flexed, but all of the exercises out of deep dorsiflexion, work with that for a few weeks until symptoms settle, and then start to use one of those exercises to increase that dorsiflexion range starting perhaps doing that calf raise on the edge of a, a small weight or even the edge of a small book and then gradually bit by bit progressing the range while keeping the load the same so we're not changing too much at once. And then towards the end stages we, we, we can work into deeper ranges if it's indicated and sometimes it is. If you think about a runner that wants to do lots of hill running and they've got insertion of Achilles tendinopathy, they're going to be exposing that Achilles to load in deep dorsiflexion. A hurdler that wants to be leaping over hurdles and has got hamstring tendinopathy, they need to load that hamstring in a position where it's stretched and where there's lots of hip flexion. So for those particular patients, it's even more important that we take them through to that level um, of range within their rehab. So again, it's really thinking about the end point and how far they want to go. The final thing we want to think about here then is speed. Now there's kind of a speed spectrum here. At one end, we have your slower speeds and that comes typically with a longer time under tension. So that might be things like your long hold isometric exercises, but also uh, perhaps your heavy slow resistance training. And the benefit that it comes with is the long time under tension, working a muscle for a long period of time is thought to help with tendon adaptation and is also quite effective for building strength. So that end of the spectrum is, is good if we're looking to build strength and it's usually not too provocative for tendon symptoms too because we're not asking the tendon to produce force at speed. We're not asking it to work like a spring which we know it finds difficult. The other end of this speed spectrum, where we're asking uh, for more, more speed, we're working at higher speeds, here we're going to see shorter time under tension, we're going to see probably higher peak loads for the tendon, and it's going to have to behave a bit more elastically, so it's more challenging for the tendon, more provocative, but it's also more likely to restore power, which is important because we know there are power and plyometric deficits often in tendinopathy. 
So perhaps in the early stages, we're going for slower exercises, slower speed, longer time under tension. And then as we progress through the rehab and we get to the later stages and we want to restore power, once symptoms are less irritable, we're increasing the speed, reducing the time under tension and bringing in typically plyometric exercises. So we can manipulate speed at various different stages. One little uh, gem that I quite like is if you think about isometric exercises, Typically, long hold isometric exercises are going to be slow with a long time under tension, but they can be adapted based on your speed goal. So if someone's working uh, with, say, quite irritable symptoms, I might get them to do a slow ramp. So gradually build into that long hold isometric contraction, not a sudden squeeze, but a gradual build because it's often less provocative for their symptoms and work with a long hold. But if we're down the speed end of the spectrum and we're wanting, wanting to restore power, I may, might get them to do very rapid, explosive isometric actions to really get that muscle to produce high levels of peak force very quickly. So hopefully you can see there how you could adjust even one exercise type depending on the goals that you want and the stage of your rehab. Now in this next section we're going to talk a little bit about um, how we might apply them in proximal hamstring tendinopathy um, and the, some of these slides come from our bonus module in running repairs online which is all about how to treat proximal hamstring tendinopathy and it's one of four different modules we have in running repairs online all devoted to uh, treating tendon pain in runners. So let's have a look at one of the slides uh, from this initially. Now this is a slide that looks at an EMG study from Zebes et al. And what you can see here is we've highlighted a number of these different exercises. The, one in, the ones in yellow are ones that have high levels of hamstring activation as found by this EMG study. So they work the hamstring quite hard, but they have low amounts of hip flexion during the exercise. So these are ideal, if we're thinking about a range, the range point of view, these exercises are unlikely to work the hamstring in deep hip flexion ranges, which will irritate it, but they will work the hamstring enough, hopefully, to increase its strength. So the Nordic hamstring curl, supine leg curl, and prone leg curl are all good, idea, good uh, exercise options for the earlier stages of hamstring tendinopathy when you want to work in smaller ranges out of hip flexion. But the ones we've highlighted in red here, again, you can see in the peak EMG column, they work the hamstrings quite hard. You've got high levels of peak hamstring activity there. But also in the hip joint angle column in the far right side, there's quite a lot of hip flexion involved in each of these exercises. So your Romanian deadlift, your seated leg curl, and your kettlebell swings will work the hamstring hard, but in a position where there's probably gonna be more compression of the tendon. So they may be more appropriate for later stages particularly kettlebell swings, they're going to combine high levels of hamstring activity with high levels of speed, as well as working in deep hip flexion positions. So you could see them as being potentially uh, quite provocative for hamstring tendinopathy. And that does seem to be the case in a clinical setting. So if we think about uh, how we might rehab tendinopathy based on these symptoms. We're thinking stage one, working with someone with perhaps quite irritable hamstring tendon. Uh, at this stage, we want to try and find a load that works with them. We're going to work out of the provocative range and typically at low speeds. So we might start with some of these exercise options isometrically, if that's better tolerated in terms of pain. So we might do a short lever bridge like uh, image A or a long lever bridge like image B or maybe some resisted hip extension using some resistance band like image C, all of which have very little hip flexion but are capable of working the hamstring quite nicely. As symptoms settle, we want to progress and typically progress onto more dynamic loading. So we come into stage two, and here we might work with perhaps having something like a prone hamstring curl where we don't have a great deal of hip flexion, but we can really work and load the tendon. We might include with that something like a single leg bridge, perhaps with some resistance uh, across the pelvis to try and get it at that 15 rep max level to start with and then gradually progress. And we might combine that with an eccentric option like a Nordic curl that you can see, uh, option A here, or the supine leg curl at the bottom, both really good for working eccentrically. And you see with all of these, again, there's very little hip flexion involved, so probably not too provocative as far as the tendon's concerned. 
So in stage two, we might progress for a while with these exercise options, increasing the load to build up the capacity and strength um, and hopefully reduce the irritability. Now if this patient with proximal hamstring tendinopathy is a hurdler like we were talking about earlier, or a hill runner, or someone that needs to expose this hamstring and its tendon to high provocative, um, potentially compressive loads with lots of hip flexion, we want to prepare them for that. So in those cases, we probably would want to progress onto stage three, where we're working into range. So we've worked to build load, now we're bringing range into the equation again. So here we might start to introduce exercises with a bit more hip flexion and a bit more compressive load. So we might include some, some deadlifts, some step ups perhaps, some lunges, which often people with proximal hamstring tendinopathy find provocative in the early stages. Some uh, single leg deadlifts or arabesques or some uh, hip thrusts, all including a little bit of hip flexion and gradually increasing the range based on symptoms and also based on the patient's goals. So we've worked through, we found a good starting point in terms of load and we've gradually progressed it. We found a starting point in range and we've gradually progressed that. The patient's doing well, we've probably also guided them through their return to sport and we've got them to a point where they're not especially irritable and they're tolerating things quite nicely. And it's that point that we might bring in some plyometric options. So we might really look to address speed and power with stage four exercises. So this is where we're gonna ramp up the speed. So we might include exercise options that you can see here, like bounding, like jumping split squats, like high knee drives or cutting movements or the sprinter leg curl or chops uh, or heel bounds, depending on really what the patient wants to do and, and what their end goal is, but exposing them to higher levels of speed, really trying to build the power and plyometric ability for them and for their tendon at those later stages. Now a practical point with this is quite often if you introduce these plyometric exercises too soon, it irritates things. And if you introduce them too aggressively, it irritates things. So typically what we might do is start by bringing in one exercise that doesn't work them into deep hip flexion ranges, uh, and see how they respond. And the focus is on speed here. It's not on working to fatigue, it's on speed and explosive intent. And if they're managing that well, we might layer in a second and possibly a third exercise, but doing it by, bit by bit to see how they respond. Now we know that as part of power, we need to be strong. So we don't at this point drop all the other exercises. We'd often typically keep the heavy slow resistance training going in there to maintain the strength and the tendon capacity and start to bring in one or two sessions of power per week planned into the schedule in a way where they can do it where they're nice and fresh so we think about how it kind of integrates with the other training sessions in their week. Okay, so that's a bit of a whistle-stop tour of how you can adjust load, range and speed in tendon rehab um, and how you can think about doing that depending on your patient's needs. As I said, really got to come back to the individual and what their goals are. If you'd like to find out more about uh, tendinopathy and its treatment, do check out those free webinar series. As I said, we've got them in the, in the link there that I put in the description and also in my uh, Instagram bio. So we've got loads of information there on Achilles tendinopathy, lateral hip pain, and also uh, back pain in athletes with a nice step-by-step -step approach to that. So be, be sure to check that out and uh, I'll look forward to answering your questions and things in the comments.